Okay, welcome back everybody. Now the moment you've been waiting for, we're going to talk about how to actually use all of this knowledge that we've been learning for the last couple hours and actually apply it to the EKG trace. So this is uh, appropriately called the approach to EKG interpretation. All right, so I don't care if you're brand new at this uh, or if you've been doing this for 20 years or 100 years, every single time you approach the EKG, you should use this five-step process. So you'll see that this five-step proce process makes us look at the rate that we're going to uh, that we're going to evaluate here, the rate of the um, of not only the ventricles but the atrial tissue as well. We want to make sure that those are the same, and then we'll talk about how we're going to do that. We also want to look at the regularity of the underlying rhythm. Some people say rhythm. The issue with that is that the rhythm is what we're after in terms of the rhythm interpretation. We actually want to see if the underlying rhythm is regularity. You can use them interchangeably as so long as you don't get confused. So the rate, the regularity, we're going to look at the P waves, whether they're there, what shape they are, what direction they're deflected in, and how many per QRS complex. And then last but not least, or second to last, we're going to look at QRS complexes. We're going to look at what shape they're in and how long they're lasting. And then lastly, we're going to look at the PR interval. That's going to tell us about how long the delay is at the level of the AV node. So you kind of have to commit this to memory. Every time you approach the EKG, you're going to find the rate of the atria and the ventricles. You're going to look for the regularity of the rhythm. You're going to look for P waves, their shape, how many, and what direction they're depolarizing in. Look at the QRS complex shape and duration and the PR interval. So let's get right into it. The best way to do this is to, uh, to look at a bunch of traces and get some practice. All right, so let's review the different methods of determining the heart rate. All right, and I say heart rate. What I really mean is the rate at which these waves or different segments are appearing on the EKG. So we're going to talk about the three methods, and then we'll also apply that not only for the ventricular stuff but also for the atrial and then we'll talk about what the rates should be in a normal, healthy person. All right, so the first, way, the first method that we're going to look at is called the six-second method. And essentially what this does, and this, you're going to see all these black rectangles. These black rectangles represent six seconds worth of time, since there aren't any hash marks because I, I crop these pictures out. So anytime you see a, a box like this, assume that it's a six-second unless I mark it otherwise. So... A six-second method says that you're going to count the number of QRS complexes that occur in a six-second period of time, and then you multiply it by 10 to get the number per minute. All right, so in this case, we would count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 QRS complexes. So 11 times 10 equals 110 per minute. So the six-second method is a really cool and easy way for us to quickly look at the EKG and decide how fast the underlying rate is. At the end of the day, we really want to know, is it above 100 or is it below 100? And we'll, we'll refine our technique a little bit to find out exactly how much it is in a little minute. All right, so you'll also notice that the six-second method is actually the best way of determining the underlying rate for a couple different um, different presentations. So irregular rhythms, irregular rhythms should get the six second method. And the reason for that is because it allows you to average things. So if you take a poll of how many of these occur over six seconds, that's actually better than looking at just the distance between two of these. Because as you'll notice here, that this QRS complex and this QRS complex, the distance between them differs from the next one, which yet again differs from the next one which differs from the next one. They're all different. So this is an irregular rhythm. And in order for us to average all these things out together, we're going to put them all together and then we'll multiply them by 10. We'll get the average of number of beats per 60 seconds worth of time. So six second method is great for irregular rhythms. It's also great for, um, for rhythms uh, in general. So you can pretty much use this always, but the, the best time to use it is when there's an irregular rhythm, or I should say you should only use the six-second method when you have an irregular rhythm uh, or for the irregular rhythm. You can use it for anything else as well, but if you have an irregular rhythm, you must use the six-second method to, uh, to obtain the rate. All right, so let's take a look at another method. This method is called the sequence method. 
Now, above and beyond you're just learning the sequence of numbers, I want you to know where these numbers came from, and here's where it comes from. If you'll recall, what is the standard paper speed of the EKG? That's right, it's 25 millimeters per second. And how many seconds in a minute? 60 seconds in a minute. These guys go away. And if you were to find out the number of millimeters per minute, we have 1,500 millimeters in every minute. So if you turned on your EKG machine, you hit the print button, and you let the print button, just don't, don't touch it again, just let this print, every minute of time, it's going to print out 1,500 millimeters worth of paper. So 1,500 millimeters is a number that's derived from the paper speed and the number of seconds in a minute. All right, so what's next? The sequence method forces you to look at the shape that you're after. In this case, we're going to use the QRS complex. And it forces you to determine how much distance exists between the QRS complex in terms of the number of big boxes. So you know that there are five small there are five millimeters between each, uh, each dark pink grid line. So that means that there are five millimeters that separate each dark pink grid line. So each big box, five millimeters. And if you look at this, if you take this number of 1,500 millimeters per minute and you divide it by five millimeters, which is the distance between two big dark pink, pink grid lines, the number you end up with is 300. That's this guy. If, however, you have two pink grid line separations, like there, it'd be 1,500 divided by 10 millimeters. There you get 150. All right, if you divide it by 15, you get 100. If you divide it by 20, you get 75. If you divide it by 25, you get 60. Right? So this sequence comes from taking the total number of millimeters per minute and dividing it by the number of big boxes, in other words, the number of millimeters, that separates two distinct things on the EKG, two distinct waveforms. So let's take a look at what happens on this EKG. All right, we're going to use this rule to calculate or to measure the rate here. So we're going to say that this is a QRS complex, and this is a QRS complex that we can easily recognize. Now we want to see what the rate of these QRX complexes per minute is. So we're going to use the sequence method. Sequence method says you start at the first QRS complex and you put a marker there. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to continue to go out big boxes. You're going to continue to move out the number of big boxes until you get to the next QRS complex. So in this case, if a QRS complex had fallen right here, rate would be 300. If it had fallen here, it'd be 150. If it had fallen here, it'd be 100. If it had fallen here, it's 75. Well, ours is kind of in the middle of these two. So it kind of falls between 100 and 75. So the rate here might be about 83 beats per minute. So this is a down and dirty method of quickly looking at the EKG and determining just by remembering a sequence of 300, 150, 175, well, it's got to be between 175, well, let's put it at 83. It's a mechanism to quickly look at the EKG and determine what the underlying heart rate is. You'll notice that it works best for rates between 60 and 150. And the reason for that is because when the rates exceed 150, you get a lot of error. In other words, rates between 150 and above are here. So, if the QRS complex falls here, what is it? Is it like 290 or is it 260? Is it 250? We don't really know because there's a 150 beat variation just in 50 uh, in five millimeters here. So a lot of variation that takes place in a really short period of time. So not ideal to use this when the rates are above 150. Again, if it's less than 60, it just means you have to memorize more sequence. So you'd have to do What's 1,500 divided by 30? What's 1,500 divided by 35? What's, so you can actually figure the sequence out. And there is, a, there is certainly more sequence to this. I think the next one's 53 and 47, 43, 40, 36, something like that. It just kind of keeps going out here. Um, but you can memorize as much as you want. But really, this is intended for rapid use. Do this, this short number here, 300, 150, 175, 60, and you're done. If you have a really, really slow rhythm, then use the six second method. If you have a really, really, really fast rhythm, let's look at a different method for calculating rate.
All right, so this is yet a different way, and this is called the 1500 method. So the 1500 method of determining the underlying rate says this. Find two shapes that you're after. In this case, it's going to be QRSs again. You're going to take the number of small millimeters, the number of small boxes that exist between two pieces, two QRS complexes, for example, and you're going to divide them into 1,500. So the overall formula is 1,500 divided by number of small boxes between two points. So in this case, they happen to be QRS complexes. So let's take a look at what happens here. Now, I always like to make my life easy, so I like to start on dark grid lines. So since there are so many QRS complexes here, I just happen to like this guy right here. And I'm going to change the color since the background's green. I'm going to use this guy here only because, whoops, I'm not going to use that guy there. I'm going to use this guy here. Let's fix that real quickly. We're going to use this guy here. And I'm going to use that guy because he happens to fall perfectly on a dark line. So now I'm going to measure. I'm going to just count the number of small boxes. So I'm going to go out one big box. That's five, six, seven, eight. So where this ends here, this guy is exactly eight millimeters. So I'm going to say the rate here is 1,500 divided by eight puts me right around the 175 mark. All right, so this 1500 method is a great method to use when the heart rate is greater than 150 beats per minute because it allows you to have extreme accuracy and precision here. We're going to get an exact number. So if you look at the number of millimeters that separates these guys, you're going to get a really, really close number. Now, let's compare this from before. Before, if we were using the sequence method, we would go 300, 150, so we know it's between 150 and 300, but we really don't know where in there. It's probably closer to the 150 end. We don't really know exactly what the number is. This gives us an exact number. You simply count the number of small boxes. You divide it into 1,500, and this gives you a very, very accurate representation of what's going on. This is called the 1,500 method. So when you're looking at the rate, you have three options. You have the six-second method, the sequence method, and the 1,500 method, all of which have specific criteria for when you should use them. Probably the most often used is the sequence method. The second most often used is going to be the six second method. And then last but not least, when you have these really fast rhythms, you can use the 1500 method. All right, so let's do a little bit of practice here. So there are a couple things going on here. Let's start with the ventricular component first, and that's the QRS complex. I see a QRS here. I see a QRS here. Well, they look to be separated by a lot. So let's do something here. Let's take a look. I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to start here and we're going to use the 300 uh, sequence method. Let's see what, what happens here. So I'm going to say, hey, here we go. 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. Uh oh, I'm out of numbers. So maybe that wasn't the best method for me to use. All right, well, I see a, a, a box here. All right. And you won't always have a box in the field, of course, but you'll have these little hash marks at the top. These little hash marks will signify, um, uh, three seconds or 10 seconds. They'll be, they'll be specific. I'll show you those in class. But these hash marks will mean something and you won't need this black box anymore. So we're going to use this black box to allow us to see that, in fact, we have a six second period of time here. And all we need to do is say, all right, we have one, we have two, we have three. Now take a look at what's happened here. What if I move this black box over to here and to here. Now I get one more QRS complex in there. So I'm actually going to do that. I'll just slide that over and say one, two, three, four. My ventricular rate equals 40 beats per minute. Now there's something else taking place here. And I'm going to erase these ventricular marks for now just to eliminate any confusion. There's something else that's taking place that's kind of cool here. And I want you to draw your, I want to draw your attention to these guys right here that occur right before the QRS complex. And hopefully in your mind, you should say, hey, those look like P waves. And if I asked you, why do those look like P waves? You'd say, well, because they're upright, they're rounded, they precede the QRS complex. And they appear just to be like a P wave. Their, their shape is right and the position's right. And I would say to you, you're absolutely correct. Then I would draw your attention to these guys here. And I would say to you, well, what do you think these little guys are? And hopefully, if you look at these things, you should be able to say, well, if this is a P wave based on its shape, then what else 
but a P wave, can I call this guy because they're exactly the same looking? So when you have multiple components on the EKG that look exactly the same, then you're going to call those exactly looking things the same thing as something that you know. In other words, you know this is a P wave, you know this is a P wave, and therefore these must also be P waves. All right, so we actually have multiple P's for every QRS here. And you don't need to worry about that right now, other than the fact that I want to use that so that you can see what it looks like to calculate the rate here. So let's do that. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take these P waves and we're going to say, hey, let's see if we can find one that falls right on the line. There's not a great one here. Let's see if we can use this guy here. And we're going to accomplish something here. So we can do a couple things. Here's a P wave here and here's a P wave here. So as long as you're consistent with where you start and where you end, it doesn't really matter if you start at the very beginning of the P wave, so long as you as you stop counting at the beginning of the next one. It just so happens there's a big dark pink line here, so I'm going to use this and I'm going to say 300, 150, 100. So my P wave rate is just over 100. I'm going to call it 110 beats per minute. And I'm going to say that the atria are 110 beats per minute, the ventricles are 40 beats per minute, and in fact, if we were to calculate this very precisely, which we could do with the 1500 method, we'd find that the ventricles are right around 40 beats and that the atria are right around 120 beats, meaning that we have a 3 to 1 relationship between the atrial activity and the ventricular activity. That's going to come at a later time. Right now, what I want you to focus on is just the rate meaning that I want you to be able to look for QRS complexes and determine how fast they're occurring, in this case using the six second method. Then I want you to find P waves. Usually you only have one P for every QRS. In certain diseases you have multiple P's. When you have multiple P waves, or if you don't have multiple P waves, I want you to calculate the rate. You're always going to look for the P waves and you'll use, again, one of the three rate determining methods for figuring out what the atrial rate is. Most of the time they'll be the same, meaning that your atrial rate will equal your ventricular rate because there will be one P wave for every QRS. But remember one of the first things that we do, the approach, is that we're going to look for all the P waves on the EKG so that we can get the rhythm correct. All right, so that's our practice. We'll certainly do a lot more of this in class. All right, next thing we want to look at is the regularity of the rhythm. And here are the possibilities. You can have a regular rhythm, meaning that everything marches out. So if you were to have QRS complexes on that rhythm, the distance between these QRS complexes, not this one, would be exactly the same. You can have an irregular rhythm where there is a pattern to the irregularity, such as something like this. So this is irregular because they don't all march out, right? Whoops, doesn't march. Whoops, doesn't march. Whoops, doesn't march. So there's this irregularity that's taking place, but if you look at this, there's these groups that takes place. So there is a regular, irregular rhythm taking place. Last but not least, you have an irregularly irregular rhythm, and that would look something like this, where there's simply no pattern at all whatsoever to the regularity. So let's take a look at what these things look like. So if we look at this, and I'm just going to look at QRS complexes now, if we were to measure the distance between these two QRS complexes, we, would, we could do so by taking a little piece of paper and lining it up right up against these QRS complexes. So you're going to move your paper right up just like that. And you'd put a little hash mark on this piece of paper and a little hash mark on this piece. And you would simply slide that piece of paper over. And those hash marks, if they line up from complex to complex, then the rhythm is regular. So... You look at the QRS complexes, you can grab a little piece of paper, they also make calipers to do this, a compass works. You just line up the two points of the compass, or you take your calipers and line them up, or you just take the old method of taking a little piece of paper and just making sure that these things actually march out. So the distance here is exactly the same across. The distance is exactly the same. This is a regular rhythm. All right, the next thing we want to look at are is this rhythm. So. If you look here, we have this guy here, and then we have something weird that happens here. And then we have this guy here, then something weird that happens, and this guy, then something weird that happens. And if you look at this, you'll see that the distance that exists here is different than that that exists here. Is here is different than here. Now, if you take this guy, and you take this guy, and you take this group, and this group, and this group, and this group, 
and you were to measure the distance between the normal looking guy and the weird looking guy, they're all the same. This equals this equals this equals this equals this. This is called a regularly irregular rhythm. So here there is this irregular pattern that's taking place, but there's regularity to the pattern of irregularity. So these are grouped beats. They're regularly irregular. Last but not least, you have this. So if you were to take a little piece of paper and you were to plop it down right here, for example, doesn't matter where you start, and put your little hash marks, no matter where you move this piece of paper on this tracing, it's going to be different, meaning that the distance between these QRS complexes are all different. There are no two that are alike. And if you do find two that are alike, there's absolutely no pattern to them. They're completely irregular. This is called irregularly irregular. So this is going to play an important role in a little while because out of 35 or so rhythms that we're going to learn, there are only five that meet this. So when you look at an EKG, eventually you're going to be able to take this little snapshot with your eyes and you're going to look at the EKG and the first thing that might jump out at you is that you have an irregularly irregular rhythm and now you know you're only looking for five things. Again, when we have regularly irregular rhythms, there are only two that can cause this. So out of 35 possibilities, if you see patterns, groups, there are only two that can cause this. So recognizing irregularity in the rhythm really quickly allows you to narrow down the choices that quickly as well. All right, so we've covered all of the important pieces here. We looked at the rate. We looked at the rhythm. We looked at P waves, QRS, and PR intervals. This is the approach to ECG interpretation that you will perform hundreds and thousands of times before you leave class. And this is the way that experts and amateurs alike look at the underlying rhythm to determine what the underlying rhythm is. So let's do this exercise together before you get into some practice. So let's look at the rate first. These look pretty close together, so I'm going to use the sequence method. Now, I can't even use the six second method because I don't have enough. So I'm going to take, and I'm going to start here, and I'm going to go 300, 150, 100, 75, 60 would be right here. So I'm a little above 60, so I'm going to say my rate here is 70. I'm going to look for P waves next. I'm going to look before the QRS complex, and I'm going to look elsewhere as well to see if I see anything that looks similar to this. So here's a P, here's a P. I don't see any P waves anywhere else, so I'm going to say that there's only one P wave for every QRS. The shape is right. The duration is right. Everything looks to be on the, on the up and up. So here I would just say that they're present and they're upright. That's perfect. Next, I'm going to look at the rhythm, the underlying rhythm or the regularity of the rhythm. Again, you don't have very much to work with here, but the distance between these QRS complexes is exactly the same, so it's going to be regular rhythm. Next, we're going to look at the QRS duration. So I'm going to put myself a little mark there and a little mark there, and I'm going to count the number of small boxes between these two things, and I'm going to say it's one. It's almost two boxes. Let's just call it two boxes for the sake of simplicity. In any case, we're going to say 80 milliseconds, certainly within our normal of less than 120. And then last but not least, let me get rid of one of these guys. Last but not least, we're going to look at the PR interval. That starts right about here. It ends right here, and again, we'll count the number of small boxes. So one, two, three, about four small boxes. That's 160 milliseconds. So these are normal findings. All right, so every time you approach the EKG, remember to look for the rate, both atrial and ventricle, the regularity of the rhythm, whether there are P waves or not, and if so, what's their shape and what direction are they pointing in, QRS complex presence and duration, and then the PR interval duration as well. All right, so we covered quite a bit of stuff in this. We talked a lot about the approach to EKG interpretation and the many different rules that we're going to start learning, but this serves as the foundation for all the rest of the work, and stay tuned for the sinus rhythms.